now more than ever, people need to go within and plug into that cellular memory, plug into the divine source, detach as much as possible from the matrix. Hello again, everybody. This is James Bartley, and you're listening to Bartley's Commentaries on the Cosmic Wars. Today, I will be talking a bit about my labs, the my lab situation, and how it's degenerated quite intentionally, I might add, into a big circus sideshow act. This is due to the malign influence of certain people who've popped up in the last few years making all these claims, banding about the word super soldier, secret space program. You see, just the term secret space program, somebody thought that up, folks. Secret space program. Oh, the person's in a program. Oh, it's a secret program. He's programmed. She's programmed. Secret space program. Very catchy, right? Like a, like a Tom Petty song. Really catchy. Catches on. Now, I must draw a parallel and actually more like a contrast between the kind of misgivings I've had over the years with some of the older crop circle researchers, right? Nowadays, it's very fashionable amongst the so-called old guard of, of crop circle researchers to say, oh, you know, back in my day, Crop circles were real, only a few of them were hoaxed. And, and the ones nowadays, 99.999999 ad infinitum percent of the crop circles today are hoaxes and only a infinitesimally small amount, of which I happen to investigate, thank you very much, are legitimate. It's like this dismissive thing where, oh, you know, because I've been around longer and I did crop circle investigations way back when, uh, even before Doug and Dave like manifested out of the ether. For some reason, uh, that makes me the authority on the subject, and anyone who's come along after, uh, they're not legit, and they're just investigating hoaxes anyway. Okay, So I point that out, because it's going to sound hypocritical when I say that back in the old days, those of us who did my lab research did things a lot differently than what a lot of people, especially those that have tried to make a name for themselves, the way they operate, right? So I don't want to seem like a hypocrite, but I want to draw, a, I want, I point that out to you. I, I bring out the example of these, you know, <laughs> fuddy duddy, uh, stick in the mud type crop circle researchers who say that all crop circles today are a hoax. Uh, only the re- the only real ones were the ones that we investigated way back when, and I've always had a problem with that. Uh, that always struck me as being presumptuous, as being arrogant, as being dismissive towards the efforts of crop circle researchers of today. So, you know, I I throw that out there to draw a parallel with what I'm going to say. It may sound hypocritical, but I'm, I'm making a point here. When we first started hearing about my lab cases, and we didn't even call them my lab cases back in the day. Uh, we called them military-type cases in, in, in California because we didn't know what else to call them. It was only when Helmut Lammers came out with a book, My Labs, you know, sometime later that, oh, the name stuck, right? And depending on where you're from and how you pronounce it, Mill Labs, I'm from California mostly, so we have the long vowel sound, My Labs. And back then, we called them military-type cases. And back then, when we first started getting these reports... And the first book started coming out about my lab cases. Dr. Carla Turner's epic, epic, seminal uh, first book, Into the Fringe, where she talks about uh, her family, ET experiences, family and close friends, as well as military experiences. People I knew personally, like Diane Johnson uh, from the high desert of Southern California, a dear friend of mine, Lorena, who I knew very well and uh, who I hope to get on the show pretty soon. A friend of mine who since passed away, Donna, wonderful gal. She was a volunteer firefighter, very credible, first responder. She had a lot of my lab experiences. In fact, one time in an underground base in the high desert of Southern California, she was being taken one way down this corridor in an underground base, and coming in the opposite direction was Lorena being escorted by military people in 
I, whether it was Donna or Lorena that said this, she, she said they, they recognized each other immediately because they're friends and they attended the same uh, MyLab support group. And what are the other one? I can't remember which said, you don't want to know what's going to happen to you once you go into that room <laughs> that I just came out of, words to that effect. I got to know the high desert Southern California MyLab crowd, or at least some of them anyway. Through, once again, my mentor, the late, great Barbara Bartholik. Barbara Bartholik was in frequent phone comms with Joy Spivey. Joy Spivey had her own support group in the high desert. At the same time, she had her support group in the high desert, working with a lot of my labs and alien abductees, lots of reptilian stuff going on in the high desert, lots of military involvement, total military involvement uh, up there. Barbie introduced me to Joy Spivey, gave me Joy Spivey's phone number, called her up, and I quickly made arrangements for Eve Lorgan and I to go up to the high desert, the Victorville area, and that's where we got to know Joyce, her husband, both Joyce and her husband are, have since passed away. Uh, her husband was a retired judge, if memory serves, and we met uh, the group of my labs and abductees there in the high desert. They used to have meetings in uh, Joyce's house and Evie and I came up and we got to know Joyce Spivey, got to know Lorena, got to know Donna, got to know a number of other people, right? Uh, there was an ex-Air Force guy, black gentleman. Where was he based at? I think it was either Beale Air Force Base or McClellan Air Force Base, one of the two there. I think it was Beale where the SR-71 was based for a while uh, there outside of Sacramento. He was based there for a while, and he he himself had my lab experiences. In fact, and he always made a joke about it, and we always got a good he always got a good laugh about it. A lot of people will will show you like marks on their legs or their arms or what have you. He woke up and <laughs> so they'd done something to his penis. Whoever the ETs or the military, they did something surgically to his penis, and he woke up and WTF, right? And so, you know, we met a number of people there. I met an ex-Marine a based at Camp Pendleton. I think I told the story in some of my writings because yeah, I thoroughly debriefed him on, on what had happened to him with the blessing of Joyce, and, and the guy wanted to tell me anyway. Uh, he was a Hispanic American uh, attached to a Marine Corps headquarters at, uh, for a particular unit. I can't remember which at Camp Pendleton, California, he had a crypto clearance, and he told me, he prefaced the story to me by saying, you know, my dad was in the military too, and he told me, never volunteer for anything, right? And, you know, somehow, he says, in so many words, I got volunteered into this project where, long story short, he was put into a bus with other Marines and then mind-controlled and taken to an underground base, and, you know, things really degenerated and unraveled for him, you know, from that point. And back then, when we heard about these military-type cases, there was Leah Haley from Alabama and Mississippi. She lived in both places, of memory serves. And then later on, oh, geez, what was her name? Uh, Kay, Katie, uh, I forget her name, but she, she wrote the Alien Jigsaw puzzle, uh, the, rather the Alien Jigsaw book. Katrina, Katrina Wilson, that's who she is. She's since kind of dropped out of sight. Because she went through a lot of harassment, a lot of interference. Uh, there was people in San Diego I knew very well be, uh, because I hung out with them. They were mates of mine. Uh, Howard, he was a surfer in, in his uh, 50s. He was a property manager. Uh, he'd gone through all kinds of ET and military stuff. And there was people in Orange County that, that I knew and people from L.A. that I knew that had my lab stuff and people in... Uh, San Diego County, uh, there, there's actually an underground, there's a lot of underground bases in San Diego County alone, right? Uh, Poway, there's an underground base there in um, North County, San Diego. There's an, actually an underground aerospace base there, and I saw one of the triangular-shaped craft. This is adjacent, right next to Miramar, what used to be... Uh, you know, the naval uh, air station there, NAS Miramar, a.k.a. Fighter Town USA, where the uh, West Coast F-14 Delta Tomcats were, were based at and where they made that silly movie, uh, Top Gun. 
You know, I, I knew people that used to run Top Gun, and they said that it's nothing like they showed on TV. It was it was more like a reality game show on TV instead of the serious work of you know air combat maneuvering. But right next to uh, well, beneath Miramar, right there, which is now Marine Corps Air, Marine Corps Air Station Miramar, uh, they they have an underground base there, and north of that or adjacent to that is Poway, and and there's an underground base there. A lot of corporations, aerospace corporations. So over time, and, and also East County, San Diego, there's uh, an underground military base there. Right. Never mind the places where you know there's a surface level under uh, military base and, and, and there's an underground base beneath that. So there were underground bases all over Southern California, all over San Diego County. And when we heard about these MyLab cases, when we met with other MyLabs, and I'd had my own MyLab experiences and, and others I knew closely, uh, my old buddy, Craig from Las Vegas had a lot of my lab stuff. You know, to us, we saw it as, geez, you know, now what? It's like it's bad enough that, you know, we're getting messed with by some of these negative ETs, reptilians, manis beings, and greys and whatnot. And some of us would have positive encounters with, you know, relatively positive or seemingly positive beings, but we also had negative experiences with negative beings. And when this military my lab element came in it was like geez it's like on top of all of this now there's this my lab military element okay let's put our heads together let's figure this out what the hell's going on and we would meet with other my labs and we would you know brief each other about our own experiences or debrief the other person or persons about what they'd gone through and it was very much all about problem solving mode and it was no, not a situation where, okay, you know, we're going to call ourselves super soldiers. And, yeah, and, you know, one time this being came down and patted me on the head and told me that uh, this being is is from the yellow lantern hexagonal ostrich alliance. Yeah, I mean, none of that ever happened back then. Because if a being came up to me and said, well, I'm from the Yellow Lantern Hexagonal Ostrich Alliance. I'd say, um, your point is, you know, I'm I'm watching this baseball game. I'm I'm reading this book. You know, I mean, you got somewhere to be, right? But for whatever reason, nowadays people get all this mileage out of these. And and it comes down to what they call the intelligence intelligence world non confirmable intelligence. I mean, I can rock up to you and say, "Well, I just had a, an encounter with a member of the Yellow Lantern Hexagonal <laughs> Ostrich Alliance," right? But it doesn't mean anything. And I can spin and weave this big whole long tale about being an ambassador, and that's another thing about some of these super soldiers today, so called. They always, in, at the risk of sounding redundant. At the risk of sounding like I'm repeating myself, right? Perish the thought, you know. I mean, look, in traditional societies, we we respect the elders, right? Because they have a uh, they're a fount of wisdom. They have a lot of information. They can help us young bucks. And at the end of my 52nd year, I still consider myself a young buck. Thank you very much. And in traditional societies. You know, these elders, they can teach us young bucks and young does a lot. And we can learn from them. We don't have to go through all the wailing and gnashing of teeth and all the hardships and all the crap they went through, right? I mean, some of the stuff we have to go through to kind of season us, to toughen us, to strengthen us, kind of a trial by fire kind of thing. But some of the, <laughs> some of the stuff we put ourselves through is completely, totally unnecessary, right? I mean, usually done through ignorance, self-indulgence, ego, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, there are easier ways to learn certain lessons. And so in traditional societies, I understand the importance of looking up to elders. And to a degree, I, I want to see that come back in our so-called advanced Western society. Who was I was talking to? Uh, Neil Cruz. I had him on the show, and he talked about 
you know, this Native American elder telling all these people at this meeting in England somewhere, it's like, you know, the people here, they don't respect us elders. It's like, you know, a lot of us um, senior citizens were waiting in this line, you know, for food or, you know, to order, and, and nobody took the time to, you know, let us come to the front of the line or order, right? And, and I understand that. It's important. I would add that, you know, my only caveat is that a lot of the older people in our Western civilization they have a lot to answer for because they dropped the ball. They fumbled, all right? Now, a lot of them were imbued, indoctrinated with a lot of programming. That's true. I understand that, right? The good war, World War II, it was not a good war. It was a manipulated war. It's like World War I was and all the wars before it. But, you know, there was a trial by fire for them. But a lot of them never learned the important lessons. They never saw the hidden hand. And so nowadays, there's a lot of these crotchety, old, spiteful, negative people. Even the one, a lot of the ones that even know what's going on or have an idea or at least a surface-level idea of what's going on, they, they have a really spiteful, negative attitude, right? And another thing about them is some of them, God has blessed them, some of them repeat themselves endlessly, tell you the same things over and over and over. It's like... Jeez, you know, cut it out already, right? I've heard this before. Don't you remember? But maybe not. Maybe they've taken so many flu vaccines, ate so much GMO food before they cottoned on to what's going on that, right, they, you know, the neural pathways were embedded and they just keep saying the same things over and over. So cycling back to my point, at the risk of sounding like a senile old person who repeats himself endlessly, one thing about these my labs today, some of them anyway, is they always seem to put themselves at the epicenter of events. Now, granted, there are times when a given my lab can find himself in a pretty interesting, high level, kind of epicenter situation, right? But the my labs I'm in combo with, they just tell me it, uh, their experiences in a very matter of fact manner. They can be telling me about all kinds of amazing things. And I ask them, like, oh, well, what are you making of that? I, I don't know. That's all I remember. I don't know what it means. That's, that's just whether or not it really happened, whether it was a screen, I don't know. I'm just telling you. You know, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to figure it out. But a lot of the people today that try to make a name for themselves, they... They embellish. They put themselves at the epicenter of events. They, oh, you know, I'm an, an ambassador for, you know, the the hexagonal ostrich alliance or whatever. I mean, it's ridiculous. What was interesting was Corey Good was reaching out to me over and over and over, sending me all these emails, sending me all these Skype messages. Finally, I relented. This was several years ago now, right? Finally, I relented. Okay, let's chat. Let's do an actual voice chat just to get it over with, right? And then during the course of this conversation, when I mentioned that some of the some of the my labs I know have gone through stargates, have gone through jump rooms, they really do exist, despite what some of these armchair experts think. They really do exist. And what happened was Corey goes, oh no no no! You know, my my sources say that there's some kind of astronomical misalignment going on, and none of the stargates. None of the portals to other worlds, to other dimensions, to other planets. None of them work right now. Now, I don't know what his take is about portals and stargates since then. But back then, several years ago, right? That's what his belief was. And it was a belief based on what his woo-woo insider sources told him. And at that moment, folks, I completely lost interest in him. I completely lost interest because I knew for a fact that people I know were being sent through I, I mean folks if people are being pulled through portals out of their bedroom out of their home into an underground base or you know or portals are opening up and entities are coming out of it or military personnel are coming out of it in physical 3D bodies or astrally right astral operators coming out of portals if that's going on at the local ground level it's why is it so hard to believe that it's going on on a grander, more cosmic scale? And I'm not talking about Mars. Everyone talks about Mars. Mars is like Mars is like your dining room table. Mars is like where your refrigerator is in the in in the kitchen. 
I mean, it's not even as far out as your your, your front porch or, or your driveway. That's how local Mars is. It may take a little bit longer to get there in certain craft. But through these stargates, jump rooms, jump gates, whatever you want to call them. And I heard the jump gate uh, term, jump room term, back in the late 80s, early 90s. That's not something new that, you know, like Randy Kramer or anyone else came up with. I heard that term long ago. And if you go back far enough, you will see articles in military magazines like Gung Ho. And I don't know if people realize it, but I am a student of military history with an emphasis in special operations, covert operations, etc., etc. And not only have I read a lot of stuff about these subjects, I've augmented my understanding by countless hours debriefing people that have been in surface-level black ops. And... Part of that learning process was I'm reading so you know magazines like Gung Ho, and Gung Ho was a military magazine. It was devoted towards readers with an interest in military stuff, particularly military special operations stuff. And there was a particular issue back in the day where they talked about Area 51, Groom Lake, and how their sources were telling them that they even have bases on Mars, right? And I remember back in the day, Bill, you know, Bill Hamilton uh, from Southern California, he developed sources that told him that there was a base on Mars. Bob Lazar privately told people like John Lear and others that there was a base on Mars. I know people personally who've been taken in craft or through stargates to Mars. Mars is very local, folks. It's nothing to write home about, Okay. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not being dismissive of what may or may not go on there. I'm sure there's slave labor that goes on there because there's slave labor that goes on in the underground bases, slave labor that goes on in the moon. And so, from the reports I've heard, there's slave labor going on on Mars. And why shouldn't there be? Because of all these evil controlling systems. So, cycling back to the comment that Corey Good made oh, no, no, you know, my sources, my woo woo sources, right? Think of. Um, uh, what's his name? Nick, what's his name, who wrote the book uh, about UFO crashes, and then later on he became a, a Roswell debunker. Nick Redfern, in his uh, unnamed, uh, unknown woo-woo sources that told him that the bodies recovered at, at Roswell were just like deformed, uh, mutated midges used in bizarre radiation experiments. Yeah, yeah, whatever. Where are your sources? Show them to us. Show them to us, right? See how, what the double standard is. When, when Leonard Stringfield came out and started talking about his sources in uh, ex-military or ex-intelligence people talking about crash retrievals and seeing alien bodies on, on site or in a, a secure facility somewhere, all these fuddy-duddy, stick-in-the-mud UFO researchers, where are your sources? Where are your sources? This is in the 70s, folks. Back then, the people were getting bumped off for having a fuzzy, blurry UFO photograph. And these lunkheads in the UFO f- community, so-called, were demanding that, that uh, Leonard Stringfield uh, expose his sources. That's tantamount to saying to a, a Cold War-era spy handler, or even a spy handler today, yeah, show us, tell us who your assets are, tell us who your sources are, tell us who your moles and, and intelligence operatives are. Little known fact, and this shows you that the double dealing is how they throw lives away, but uh, Pavel Fitin, F-I-T-I-N, if I'm pronouncing that right, he was the uh, NKVD predecessor of the KGB resident in Washington, D.C. during World War II. He worked hand in glove with longtime uh, Soviet uh, ass kisser Avril Harriman, right, U.S. ambassador to Russia, Soviet Union during World War II, arch manipulator with his Brown brothers, Harriman and Banks, Guarantee Trust, etc., etc. In this book written by establishment historian, intelligence expert, so-called uh, Christopher Andrew, in that book, uh, Christopher Andrew points out how William Donovan, the head of OSS in World War II, I guess as 
as a gesture of goodwill, gave over the names of all, repeat all, the undercover OSS uh, agents, operatives, field operatives in Europe and Eurasia to his counterpart, Pavel Fitton. And you can imagine what happened to all those <laughs> those operatives that uh, William Donovan, whose organization was riddled with communist spies, his second in command, I think his name was Duncan Lee, Duncan somebody or other, was, um, was a Soviet spy. But, see, that's what would happen. I mean, if Leonard Stringfield back in the day knuckled under, oh, yeah, this is the guy who told me about this crash retrieval. This is the guy that told me about that crash retrieval. You imagine the kind of harm, the trouble those people would, would come under. And Stringfield came under a lot of criticism because he protected his sources. But nowadays it's okay. We just, you know, we just invoke these woo-woo sources like Nick Redford. Oh, my woo-woo sources who go back to the Roswell days. They said it was just deformed, you know, mutated midgets, right? And so we're just supposed to believe that. Roswell didn't happen. It was just some experiment using deformed little midgets. But they're human. They're just deformed. And then, and then Corey Good rocks up. Oh no, my woo-woo sources say that you know, due to some astronomical misalignment, uh, none of the stargates work, right? And and I don't know what tune he's singing now, but that's what the tune he was singing then. And at that moment, I just lost interest in him. Okay, I lumped him in the category of a time waster. And if if you were part of the old crowd <laughs> back then, the worst, the worst slur someone can hurl at you which we hurled at people left right and center because we were busy and we had a lot of stuff to do was this person's just a time waster right and so when he told me that oh these stargates don't work i just lost interest and then on top of that what Corey good started doing was he started like name dropping me he, you know, he was telling everybody online and in person that he was making it sound like he and I were mates. And he was like like writing all these messages in these forums. Uh, I'm desperately, he used that term desperately, I'm desperately sending all these my labs to James Bartley. Like, like, time out, time out. Wait a minute. What do you mean you're desperately sending all these people to me? And all that time, there was only one person who, who came to me that was referred to by by uh, Corey Good, And I, I, I stayed in coma with this person for a little while. And I felt they were legit, but, you know. But I, I, I messaged Corey. I said, look, you got to stop doing this. First of all, I don't agree with your findings. I don't necessarily believe them. And I have my own vetting procedures as far as my labs and, and determining who's real and who's a whack job. Okay, And there's no shortage of whack jobs who claim to be alien abductees, who claim to be, uh, to be my labs. There's a lot of delusion, a lot of schizophrenia, a lot of entity infestation going on with a lot of these people. Right, or some of them rather, and so I had to write Corey. I said, "Look, you know, please, you know, it, it was a it was a live chat I was with him with on Skype." I said, "Do not, you know, tell people that, you know, that you're working with me and that you know, implying that I agree with your findings and saying that you're sending all these people to me, you know, so I can help them, right? Because because that's not what's hap- that's not what's happening, right? Name dropping, uh, kind of like." trying to bask in the reflective glow, if you you want to put it that way, of, of like associating with me or acting as if he's associated with me. There's the same thing that happened to Donald Marshall. Donald Marshall is writing personal friends of mine, right, colleagues, some of the top players in the field, and saying, oh, James Bartley this, James Bartley that, when I don't even take Donald Marshall seriously, right? And so what's happened now is, it's turned into such a circus sh- sideshow act that you know Richard Dolan had to like put out this disclaimer saying, "Oh, you know, I've basically been blindsided by MUFON because you know without telling me they they put me on a panel with all these people. I can't even remember who it is, Randy Kramer, wh- whoever, right? Andy Basiaggio. I, I don't know who these guys are. Look, when Andy Basiaggio came on coast to coast and he said oh yeah in my very first and i'm paraphrasing here my very first like uh stargate operation 
uh, you know, when we were sent back, and then this little kid, I remember, forget the age of the kid, 6 years old, 12 years old, something like that, 11 years old, was in the process of being sent back through the Stargate. And you can go back to Coast to Coast and listen to this, right? Basiadro says this kid said, oh, you know, because the kid lost his leg. Somehow in the process, kind of like in the old Star Trek when, when like, the teleporter... <laughs> Scotty beat me up when the teleporter malfunctions, right? And, you know, and sometimes in the, uh, in, in the shows, like, Kirk would split into two, right? And then you'd have the passive James T. Kirk and then the aggressive, you know, rapacious James T. Kirk. This is my ship. I am the captain of this ship. Then you have the passive James T. Kirk because it was some weird malfunction with the teleporter, right? Well, according to Basiaggio, and you can listen to his original one of his first interviews on Coast to Coast, one of the kids he was sent back with lost his leg in the process. And he said to the he said the kid made a statement like, Oh, you know, I'm only like eleven or twelve years old and I've lost my leg and now, you know, what what's gonna happen? What am I gonna do for the rest of my life? Me and a close friend of mine were listening to that and we, we just looked at each other, turned this shite off, right? Because like, I'm an old Marvel Comics guy, long before Netflix. Thank you, Netflix, putting out Daredevil and Iron Fist and Luke Cage, etc., etc. Right? I used to be an old Marvel Comics head back when I was younger. And I would remember you'd be reading this, uh, like, comic, and then some supervillain pops up out of nowhere. In the midst of a backflip, this supervillain spews out his whole life story. You know, uh, how he turned out, started out as a good person, then, you know, life kind of went pear-shaped on him, and then he turned into a bad guy, and, you know, he, he developed these powers through some kind of weird, you know, uh, scientific experiment gone awry, yada, yada, yada. All this in the space of, like, two backflips, and there's a big bubble where all these, these words are coming out of his mouth, right, and all the dialogue in it. And and when I'm listening to Andrew Basiaggio saying, yes, this kid said, oh, I'm only, you know, you know, such and such years old and my whole life is ahead of me and now I've, you know, I've lost my leg. What am I going to do with the rest of my life? It's like it reminded me of like those soliloquies in Marvel Comics when the supervillain trying to justify himself, you know, it just goes off on a rant and or he's, you know, in the midst of a backspin or a backflip and then he just tells his story in, in like in the space of two backflips, this big long story that takes about two to three panels, right? And that's what I thought of when I heard Andrew Basiaggio say that. Me and my friend, who was, you know, a close friend of mine, who's a, who was in my lab, right? Who, who uh, you know, uh, as a young girl, was messed with by high, high-ranking, world-famous politicians and was used also in deep black weird science ops with aliens and alien technology. We just looked at each other and to quote her, she said, turn this shit, all right? Because, you know what? It's like it was an insult to our intelligence. Because a kid's not going to be going, oh, you know, I lost my leg and I have my whole life in front of me. Now what am I going to do? I'll tell you what that kid's going to do if he really lost his leg, all right? He would go, ah, 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 cussing left, right, and center, screaming. You wouldn't have the soliloquy. It would soliloquy. It wouldn't be like you know, like a Shakespeare friggin' play where you know Macbeth or, or somebody goes into soliloquy, right? No, they'd be screaming their heads off. And so the moment I heard that, I just turned it off because you know it didn't make sense. And now, you know, getting back to Richard Dolan, Dolan put out this thing about how. I don't know if he declined going on to that panel. I wouldn't have gone on that panel. No way, no how. But you know, he wrote this thing about how he didn't feel a lot of these people were credible and yada, yada, yada. Okay, fair enough. And then he made this point about, well, you know, some people, they have a background. They have, you know, credibility insofar as you can confirm their background. But that only makes sense from his standpoint, if you're dealing with somebody who claims to be a whistleblower from within the military intelligence aerospace community. Okay, fair enough. But what about someone who's quote-unquote just a housewife or quote-unquote uh, uh, someone who cleans houses for a living, cleans other people's toilets, 
What if the my lab in question is a customer service rep, works at a fast food restaurant, but because they're not an ex-military person, because they never had a high security clearance, because they don't like have this, you know, all these credentials behind them as being, you know, part of this big military aerospace industrial complex, somehow they're not credible? No, I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that at all. Stimped, nished, as the Germans say. Like, what, we have to have, like, a, a background in the military intelligence community to be taken seriously when we say we've had ET and military experiences? That's patently absurd. I don't, now, I'm not saying that that Dolan was implying that, but when one reads the comment, if one didn't know any better, you'd think he was implying that, you know, only people with certain types of backgrounds, when they when they claim to have been involved in in, in my lab operations, so-called secret space operations, secret space programs, only people with a, a, a verifiable military or intelligence or aeronautical uh, corporation background can be taken seriously. I, well, I don't know if he was saying that, but I'm just here to say, no, if that's what he meant, then I disagree with that. Because I know too many people from all walks of life, civilians, ex-military, never having served in the military, but I know for a fact have had in the past and in some cases ongoing my lab type experiences. And I know also that there has been this effort. Veterans Today is part of this, right? You know, one time the editor of Veterans Today was going to be part of a panel I was I was on. I don't know if I mentioned this before, but and another guy too, Stu Webb, he's always invoking Enki, excuse me, Yahweh, right? Now, I respect Stu Webb for his surface level kind of research as far as, you know, the New World Order and exposing Neil Bush and Silverado Savings and Loan and, and stuff like that, right? But the guy is just totally imbued with the whole Enki, Anunnaki, Anunnaki, excuse me, Yahweh kind of brainwashing for lack of a better term oh unless we get our lives right unless we unless we connect with Yahweh this Yahweh that right it's like you know I just start to tune them out and so I was on this one show and I thought I was gonna be the only person on the show and this has happened before where you get ambushed and you expect that you're gonna be the only guest on a podcast or or a live show and then it turns into a pajama party with four five six seven eight other people talking over each other right and, and then in this process you know I, I'm told via you know the chat you know the chat boxes the private chat boxes okay we're gonna have some other people come on and one of them was St- Stu Webb and another one was the guy the editor of veterans today and I said okay this is where I exit stage left right because you know homie don't play that I'm not gonna be on a panel with a guy who keeps invoking Enki aka Yahweh and I'm not gonna be on a panel with the veterans today guy who is one of the people pushing this military kind of uh, priesthood? You know, the, the, you know, people on Veterans Today, and another one is Neil uh, Nick Pope, who's just a, a non-entity, a joke, right? Nick Pope said that only people with an ex-military or current military background are credible people when when regards to or reporting ET UFO. Uh, incidents. He he described everyone else, i.e., civilians, as being a Joe six pack, right? And, and, and Nick Pope comes from this nothing of an agency called the Flying Complaints Desk, right? Where people would call up and complain to to this British government department about low flying planes making too much noise, right? He apparently sat on this this <laughs> non entity of an agency called the Flying Complaints uh, Desk, right? And he and then they try they try to pass him off as some big shot milit um, Ministry of Defense insider as regards to UFOs. I mean the gullibility, the gullibility out there is just amazing. It really is, and that's the problem with a lot of people in the UFO field. They just fall for all these phony intrigues. There's an, there's enough real intrigue, enough black ops skull skullduggery to go around. But man, some of these people, they fall for the stupidest things. Like like one this one, you know, old woman who repeats herself endlessly, is spiteful, negative person is always complaining about politicians. She she wanted to introduce me to this guy. Oh, he worked at Pine Gap, you know, he worked at Pine Gap, 
right? And I'm going, okay, whatever. So I met this guy. I met him at a, a UFO lecture. It wasn't a UFO lecture. It was a meeting of UFO interested people, right? It wasn't even a real lecture going on. And, you know, I was there because... You know, I can order dinner afterwards and maybe have a beer or two afterwards. I mean, that's really why I was there. And so I meet this guy. And then, yeah, you know, he's all introducing himself to me. Yeah, yeah, you know, so-and-so mentions that you uh, you worked at Pine Gap. And for those of you who don't know, Pine Gap in Central Australia is, is a major uh, satellite tracking facility. I mean, that's just one of the overt surface-level activities that take place at Pine Gap, similar to, in, in some ways, to the much smaller Blue Cube uh, at uh, Sunnyvale, the uh, NSA tracking facility, NRO tracking facility in, in Greenland, uh, the, the, one, um, the ones in the UK. Anyway, I asked them, oh yeah, yeah, so-and-so mentioned you, you worked at Pine Gap, uh, what did you know about the underground base there? He goes, the, the, take my word for it, there's no underground base there. There's an Australian guy. There's no underground base there. Oh, yes, there is an underground base. Oh, no, there isn't. There isn't. I know. I go, I, I, and I said to him, well, you didn't have a need to know then, right? And this just ended this, the conversation there. Because, because right off the bat, I knew the guy was a time waster. Anytime you have an above-ground surface facility which has those types of activities, satellite tracking, downlink, uplink, satcom satellite communications sat you know satellite relay communications etc cetera, etc cetera. you're always going to have redundant infrastructure underground always comms electronic gear communications you name it command and control i was involved in what was known as c cubed i the letter c the number 3 cubed i for intelligence command control computers and intelligence you're always going to have redundant command and control systems underground in those kinds of facilities. Always. Moreover, I have a personal friend whose uncle helped to develop the underground tunnel systems and complexes beneath Pine Gap. My friend's uncle was an engineer, and this happened decades ago. What you see on the surface will be replicated underground in supposedly, quote-unquote, survivable underground installations in theory survivable for a ground level multi-megaton thermonuclear strike but i'm not too sure about that unless you had a force field you know even even lead lined ceilings and walls in an underground base won't help uh, even if you're a mile down because the heat and the radiation from the the surface level thermonuclear strike is just it would dry roast the people down there and and fry the uh, the technology from the radiation, the electromagnetic pulse. So they, they tell people, oh, this is survival underground bunker, and you heard stories in North America, Raven Rock, and places like that, right? In theory, they're supposed to survive through, you know, multiple, not just one, but multiple surface level. I'm not talking about air bursts, but ground strikes of thermonuclear warheads, multi-megaton ones. I'm not too sure. Unless you have a literal force field, electromagnetic force field, you know, I don't know how that would work. But the point of relevance is they have redundant systems underground, transportation systems, maglev trains, roads, highways underground. They have uh, livable situations, water storage tanks. And some of these underground bases are very plush, folks. They have baseball diamonds down there. They have shopping centers. They have plush accommodations uh, for, you know, the big shots that live down there. And so for this guy to rock up to me who claimed to work at Pine Gap and say, oh, yeah, you know, there's no underground base here. That's just nonsense, right? They're always going to have redundant systems underground. And so I just tuned them out and put them in the time waster bin, you know, this guy. So I just rid them, them off as a time waster. So, you know, keep that point in mind that there's a lot of, gullibility there's a lot of buying into all this phony intrigue and you know cycling back to the story the point i was going to make you know when i found out they're going to bring you know along the editor of veterans today who made a point of saying that only military people or ex-military people are credible when it comes to ufos right like nick pope the aforementioned nick pope said something very similar 
oh, any civilian who tries to report UFOs, they're just a Joe six-pack, right? How could I take him seriously when his claim to fame was being part of a non-entity of a, a MOD organization called the Flying Complaints Desk, right? And then you have Stu Webb that was going to pop up on, on the, the panel. No, I exit stage left. I want nothing to do with this. So there has been for some time now this effort of creating a new military priesthood who were going to be like the, uh, the clearinghouse of all UFO-related information. Oh, you know, that's not real because our ex-expert, you know, think of Admiral Bobby Inman, right? Super spook. He's the guy that first put out the nonsense that all UFO sightings are not alien craft, but rather misidentifications of stealth craft. Just complete nonsense. And Donald Marshall pops up. Oh, you know, 99.9% of alien abductions, that's just the military. That's a persistent, like, meme that goes around a lot, right? First of all, some of those alien abducting groups, like some of the Zeta groups, Zeta Grey groups, they themselves have been aligned with the military for a long time now, right? There was this one weird wo- woman, for instance, she claimed to be like like a gray uh, human, and, and you know the reason that she talks with her lips barely moving is because, you know, she's mostly gray and they're used to talking telepathically and they don't use their lips and their vocal cords right and that's i sat through her her lecture for amusement purposes right and she and she herself said oh you know 99 percent of alien abductions of 100 percent of alien abductions unpleasant negative experiences that's the military when she's there fronting, for, by her own admission, she's there fronting for the Zeta Greys, who themselves, by the testimony of, of plugged-in whistleblowers, have stated for a long time now that, that at least some of the Zeta groups have been working with the military, right? So who's working for who? Who's leading who? Who's got the commanding control? The, who's in charge? Who's the top dog? You know, the ETs of the military. When even Bob Lazar talked about a case at Area 51 when, you know, this stubborn, bullish American military uh, MP tried to barge into an ET-only meeting and they, and, you know, they, they hit him with a, some, some kind of directed energy weapon that gave him a lethal head wound. And then, you know, these other military people tried to barge in and, you know, help the, the, the first guy. And then they got all whacked with some weapon that gave him, you know, uh, lethal head wounds. Right. Well, from that example, it sounds to me like, you know, the military are are, are are certainly not the top dog in that facility, right? If if the ETs can just open a can of whoop ass on them and give them all, you know, lethal head wounds just like that, right? And Bob Lazar told this story years ago. So, you know, to say that oh, the, you know, it's all just military when certain ET groups are known to be working with the military, that's disingenuous and that's sin by omission. It's leaving out vital intelligence. And so, cycling back to Richard Dolan, when he says, well, he's only interested in, in, in secret space programs, so-called information from whistleblowers who have a verifiable background, right? Implying, basically, that, uh, you know, a person, unless they have some kind of verifiable military-type background, aerospace background, as far as the secret space program is concerned, and I don't even like using that term, well, only those people are credible, Right now, he said that you know, for what it's worth, he said that he was able to confirm, or other people were able to confirm William Tompkins' background, right? But he didn't take William Tompkins very seriously because he felt that he had an ego problem. And then when I read some of the excerpts from William Tompkins' book, you know, pushing the evil Nazis, oh, you know, you know, I, I, he was working for the good aliens uh, 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 against the, the the Nazis who were working with the bad aliens, you know, pushing that whole bad German, bad Nazi, you know, they're all Nazi myth, right? It's like, I, I, I tuned him out because that's that goes back to Studs Terkel's book, uh, the good war about how World War Two was a good war because they were fighting off the the evil Germans who you know deserved to be firebombed and you know can receive an onslaught day and night from you know this murderous mass terror bombings from the Royal, the British Bomber Command Eighth uh, Air Force Fifteenth Air Force of the U S and also the Tactical Air Forces never mind all the marauding armies right. 
Oh, that was all justified. And then the slaughter of 15 million Germans after World War II. Let's not forget that. That was all justified because there were no good Germans. They were all Nazis. That's the real message. And the million and a half German military POWs who were starved to death and murdered in the POW camps. Right? And William Tompkins just promotes that whole meme. And so right off the bat, it was just like I tune, I tune him out. Right? You know, he may have been in... Let's say he was involved in a secret space program, so-called. You know, the fact that he would push that evil Nazi, evil Germans, and, you know, the good war beam, it just... That lessens his credibility, in my view. But this notion that only people with a military background... Again, it goes back, folks, to the fact that there has been this concerted effort to create this priesthood of ex-military or military people as being the, the you know all-knowing, all-wise uh, group of uh, priests who, who are the final arbiter uh, the the final judge of what's real or what's not real as far as UFOs, ETs, aliens, uh, deep black military ET collusion is concerned. I see that coming, and and by having, by creating, by absolutely creating the circus sideshow act with the you know yellow hexagonal ostrich, uh, uh, you know being alliance and with people like you know, and look how much the testimony. Of people like Randy Kramer and and Corey Good and and others, how, how much it differs from the testimony of my my friend Carol Martin, uh, who was the uh, the my lab that I interviewed. Uh, it was only an hour interview. I'm going to see if she'll come on for a couple hours, and also if I can get Lorena on here and some of the others that have been around for years. Right now, these are people. Another thing too. You have to understand that the real players amongst those, and like I said in a previous podcast, I don't even like the term to use use the term my lab because it's it's so limiting. It hardly adequately describes what these people are all about. The reason they're being utilized is because they have this quantum, multi-dimensional, metaphysical component to their DNA profile, to their morphic resonance field. I'm not sure if you can just pluck someone off the street, send them through a Stargate, take them out into space and in, in, in some of these craft, and how these people would fare if you just plucked them off the street. I think it's quite possible that only certain people of a certain bloodline, a certain genetic profile, a certain morphic resonance profile, morphic field resonance, can go through an experience like that on a regular or semi-regular basis and come out of it relatively unscathed, Right? Now, to be sure, my labs, you know, have enough problems with autoimmune disorders, with, you know, various weird ailments. And, you know, nobody could figure out what happened to my friend, poor Charlotte Boudreaux, which she was subjected to. That's, that's a whole other story. Take a two-hour podcast to talk about the stuff she went through. Barbara Bartholick referred me to her. And, and before Charlotte died of mysterious circumstances, you know, she told me a lot about the my lab ET stuff she was going through. So there's a sense of elitism when one says that only military people or ex-military people, you know, have the right to talk about UFOs. They're, they're the only ones that, you know, are knowledgeable. And that's a f- meme that's being put out there a lot. And it's been going on for a while now. I'm not saying that's what Richard Dolan was implying. But... You know, it's like, I know I have my own vetting procedures. And I know a lot of us old-timers, we never took seriously a lot of these so-called super soldiers that are trying to make a name for themselves. Because cycling back to the point I was making at the beginning, when we first became aware of these MyLab military-type cases, when some of us came to the grim realization that we ourselves were having some of these military type case uh, experiences, M- you know, weird medical exper- exper- experiences, experimentation, military stuff, military training, on world and off world, okay? And in other dimensions and in alternate realities. All that is going on, folks, right? But wh- what's happened is, you know, you have two things working in, syn- in synchronistic fashion. You have this push to have only this military priesthood pronounce what's real, what's not real in all things UFO related, 
right? Veterans today even got into the whole Anunnaki thing, saying that their sources, you know, woo-woo sources that have been in common with Marduk and all this other stuff. Maybe, maybe not, right? Show us the proof. They demanded, you know, Leonard Stringfield expose his sources to, to possible death and retaliation, right? But these guys just can blow smoke at us and say, oh, yeah, we've been in combo with Marduk, right? And we're just supposed to be buy into all the phony intrigue and believe it, right? And so there's this push on the one hand that, that only ex-military people, Dr. Edgar Mitchell, you know, ex-scientist, you know, he's been totally discredited. Just the fact that he was connected with, with that pedophile, John Podesta, right? just totally discredits. I don't want to hear a thing from Dr. Edgar Mitchell anymore, right? What he should have done is call out Podesta for being a pedo, right? But still, those letters he wrote to Podesta are still floating around out there in cyberspace. So you have two things working in synchronistic fashion. You have the push for this, only the military or ex-military are qualified to talk about uh, aliens and UFOs. And on the other hand, you have the circus sideshow act of people going, oh, you know, uh, I lost my leg. I'm only 12 years old. Uh, you know, what am I going to do with my life? Uh, you know, I, I, I'm in contact with the yellow hexagonal ostrich alliance and I'm their ambassador. And Right? And so they've created such acrimony and such... Oh, here's another thing that, that, that Corey Good tried to do. Not only was he name-dropping me, right, telling all these people, oh, you know, I'm desperately sending all these MyLabs, 40. He, you know, at one point he said he sent up to 40 people to me. And no, only one person contacted me out of all the 40, I guess, that he sent, right? And if it sounds like I'm getting emotional about this, I am. Because, again, when we first got into this, when we first realized what was going on with military abductions, it was like, geez, now what? I mean, it was bad enough people are having encounters with with negative marauding ETs and reptilians and taken underground bases and messed with by non-human life forms. Now there's this deep black military element, like, superimposed on on top of that. And we went into intelligence gathering mode. Man, how, how do we deal with this? What do we do about this? This is like a, a, a rather alarming development. Back then, and, and, and to this day, the real players that are, ha- are having my lab experiences, it's like that's what they're thinking about. How do we turn this to our advantage? How do we make the best of you know what could be a rather negative, grim situation? Well, they're not calling themselves super soldiers and saying that they're part of the secret space program and you know part of the yellow hexagonal ostrich alliance. That's not happening with the real players in the field. You know, most of the real players that I know, they never even heard of Randy Kramer or Corey Good or Andrew Andrew Basiaggio. And and even when their name comes up, they just roll their eyes. You know, next subject, right? And and not only was Corey Good claiming to have sent forty people in my direction, and only one of them actually, you know, contacted me, but it seemed, if I didn't know any better, he was trying to create a conflict between me and Bill Ryan. Because Corey kept emailing me, telling me that Bill Ryan is saying that, you know, in so many words, that my labs are, you know, they got this programming and going on and, and uh, they're a menace to society. And, and one day these my labs will just rise, rise up and, you know, they'll be part of the occupying New World Order force. And, right. And he kept sending emails to me about this over and over, telling other people this. And, you know, being having had military abduction experiences myself, and that's kind of a hot-button topic for me. You know, someone, you know, claiming that, you know, my labs are of necessity a menace to society because of whatever unknown programming has been instilled in them, right? And, you know, it got to the point where I had to contact Bill Ryan personally and say, Bill, you know, Corey Good keeps saying this stuff, you know, implying that that you stated, Bill Ryan, that my labs are a menace to society. You know, I, I want to hear your take on it. Is that true? And he told me that it's most definitely not true, that he never said any such thing. And I have no reason to doubt him. You know, if one didn't know any better, they'd think that Corey had an axe to grind or, he, you know, he was trying to stir the pot. 
Well, that's all well and good, Corey, or anyone else, but, you know, why drag me into it, you know? It's like the alien that pops up to me in, in this kind of fictitious scenario and says, you know, I'm with a yellow hexagonal ostrich alliance, and I'd say, what's your point? You know, I'm, I'm trying to... You know, I'm trying to cut this commentary. I'm e I'm editing a commentary. I got a deadline to meet, right? I'm going to meet someone on Skype for, you know, an interview in a little bit. And you come rocking up, tell them you're some woo-woo alien from the yellow hexagonal, you know, like ostrich alliance. It means nothing to me. Bugger off, right? That's what the real players do. Because the real players are not gullible, impressionable people. That fall over themselves when they're told that so so and so used to work at Pine Gap, and so and so says that you know there are no underground bases or underground base beneath Pine Gap, and I'm supposed to kowtow and oh yes, all knowing, all wise, because you supposedly work there. I'm just supposed to believe you, you know. Never mind my own background in military communications and knowing a thing or two about you know SATCOM and satellite communications and and how they always develop redundant systems. Not only above ground, but underground, too. I sat through a number of conferences involving SPA Wars, Naval Space Warfare Systems Command. I knew personally members of DISA, Defense Information Systems Agency, which is a little-known sister agency of the National Security Agency. I interacted on a daily basis with members of NAVSEC GRU, a naval security group, which is the NSA naval subsidiary. So... You know, like when someone rocks up to me and tries to big shot me, it just it has no, no, no effect on me whatsoever. So those two things, folks, are working in synchronistic fashion. The Circus Sideshow Act of, you know, the Yellow Hexagonal Ostrich Sphere Alliance or whatever it's called. You know, the, the oh, I lost my leg and I'm only 12 years old. And I don't know what to do. These, these Elizabethan, like, plays, these Shakespearean soliloquies, these, these Marvel Comics bubbles where a guy's in, you know, in the midst of a backflip and he spews out his whole background life story from childhood and how things all went wrong and, and why he's justified in being a supervillain and all that in, like, two or three panels, you, you know, in a comic strip, Right. Oh, you know, I lost my leg now, and you know, what am I going to do with my life? No, they're going to be screaming their head off. They're going to be hysterical. Who are you trying to kid, right? Who are you trying to fool? I mean, it's an insult. And that's not to say he hasn't had experiences in jump rooms, in time travel, been taken to Mars, etc. It's the interpretation. It's the way the information is conveyed to the public. Is, is the issue I have. There's a lot of information, a lot of stuff my colleagues and I hold back because A, it's non-confirmable, and B, there's some things that just aren't worth talking about. There's some things that are just too dangerous to talk about. There's some things that should only be mentioned in private, away from any kind of eavesdropping, bugging kind of device because this information only has relevance to us that's going through it, Right? That, that's what goes on. It's like, let's talk about this stuff in private, right? Be, because it's a difference between, see, a lot of us, we don't have this fantasy of like, you know, saving the world, okay? We want to do our part, of course, to dismantle this matrix simulation, dismantle this prison planet complex, this recycling, soul harvesting agenda. Absolutely, we want to play our part in doing that. But the fact of the matter is, is we don't care who gets the credit. If one of us did something to actually lead to the unraveling of this matrix paradigm, I don't care if the, <laughs> I don't care if the yellow hexagonal ostrich alliance gets the credit for it. That's beside the point, right? Our cheering section is in higher spiritual dimensional realms. It's not here on Earth, which is a prison planet. We don't care who gets the credit for getting the real work done. We don't care if no one recognizes our achievements. The real work that goes on in higher dimensions and it goes on behind the scenes in this dimension. That's beside the point. Only children need a pat on the head. Only children need to be encouraged. You know, like, like children lacking self-worth. Children that, that have been traumatized and haven't worked through all their issues. Children that morph into adults and become man-children, man-child. Right? So I'm not saying that so and so who who said that a kid you know lost his leg and then went into this Elizabethan soliloquy kind of like Macbeth or somebody. I'm not saying that the person's 
non-credible and is lying about all of experiences? No, I didn't say that at all. I'm just saying I don't buy that particular experience the way it's been conveyed. And also that from an overall spectrum analysis, you know, I don't have to buy into what he says. It's my right, right? If whatever stories are being propagated, we have our own internal filter, our own discernment meter. And, it's, and we have to decide if that has resonance with us, right? Because I have my own vetting procedures and I have my own network of my labs. And we talk about this stuff amongst ourselves. And so if something doesn't resonate with us, we leave it on the shelf. It's like when you're pushing a shopping cart down the aisle. You don't just dump everything into the shopping cart. You take only you take with you only that which you can you need or can make use of at you know in the near future, and you leave the rest on the shelf. That's how it works. It's called the shopping uh, trolley approach. And I don't care what any of these people say about me. You know, my, my reputation is going to remain intact. People are still going to contact me from all walks of life that have had these experiences. And we're still going to have adult, mature conversations and discussions and debriefings about them. We're going to debrief each other. I'm going to brief them on what I know, and they're going to brief me on what they know. And that's how it's done. It's not going to be like, oh, we're, now we're super soldiers, right? Well, you know, talk's cheap. Actions speak louder than words. If you're a super soldier, then why don't you all pull your resources and get rid of this Draco Empire, get rid of this New World Order, right? Talk's cheap. Let's start seeing some action. So, you know, I only brought this up because it's all come to a head in the field where, you know, there's all these people just, you know, raising a ruckus about this whole circus sideshow act, which me and the, and the, other, and the others in the field, the real players I'm talking about, Carol, like Carol, the person I interviewed on my show, Lorena, who I'm going to have on, some of the people I've known for years, and some of the people that are, you know, you know, recently contacted me, who I know just on their vibe, on their stories, on their testimony, what they've been willing to share with me. And I always tell people, just share whatever you're comfortable with. Don't, don't tell me everything, you know, especially stuff that, you know, gives you heartburn or gives you, you know, you know, gives you the shakes or, you know, you, gives you an ab reaction. You don't have to tell me that stuff. Just, just tell me what you're comfortable sharing, right? And, and we'll go from there. So anyhow, we've reached the end of this week's edition of Bartley's Commentaries on the Cosmic Wars. Wherever you may be, dear listeners, whatever you may be doing, have a very pleasant time, and we'll see you again.